Hello and welcome to our August 15th online service. My name is Ken. I serve on staff here at Sobel Church and it's my pleasure to be your host today. Here's just a couple of things that we'd like to highlight before we get started. Church on the Beach was amazing. What a great opportunity this is for our church each year. The weather looked like it was gonna rain, but it held off and I didn't feel the first raindrop until after the last amen. It, the timing was perfect. There was a great crowd, uh, the worship team did an amazing job, and we heard a testimony from Tasha Holmes about how God used Church on the Beach four years ago to really change the direction of her life. And uh, it's just been amazing to see what God has done in her life since. Such a powerful story. If you have a chance to be a part of one of these in the future, it's definitely worth attending. We are continuing to celebrate God's faithfulness to us as a church over the past 30 years. One of the ways that we're doing this is through an initiative we call 30 for 30, where we find 30 other local organizations or groups that are doing great things in our community to help in various ways, and we come alongside them to help make them successful. Over the next month, as students prepare to go back to school, the United Way of Bruce Gray's Backpack Program is in full swing. In 2020, United Way distributed 2,700 backpacks to families and students who are in need in our area. This is a great initiative and we wanna help them be successful. Every little bit counts. We wanna to commit to 30 backpacks that are ready to go for students in our area. If you would like more information on how you can partner, simply go to sobelchurch.ca slash backpack to find out how you can purchase a backpack and fill it with the right supplies, or you can make a financial contribution so that somebody else is able to do it. If you know of an initiative in your area that we can come alongside, we would love to know about it. Contact the church office and let us know. We may just be coming to your neighborhood next. As we prepare for a time of worship today, let me ask you a question. Do you long for God? Do you long for his presence in your life? Do you want to know him more and more? The writer of Ecclesiastes says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of all humans. It's this knowledge of eternity, uh, that there must be something more to this life on earth. For many, they spend their whole lives trying to ignore this longing and bury it with all sorts of worldly distractions. But for the follower of Christ, we acknowledge that longing. We want to remove the distractions and we want to keep an eternal perspective on life. And so as we begin this morning, I want to read for you a prayer. It's called Longing After God. My dear Lord, I can but tell you that you know I long for nothing but you nothing but holiness, nothing but union with your will. You have given me these desires, and you alone can give me the thing desired. My soul longs for communion with you, for death of indwelling corruption, especially spiritual pride. How precious it is to have a tender sense and clear understanding of the mystery of godliness, of true holiness. What a blessedness to be like you, as much as, is, as it is possible for a creature to be like its creator. Lord, give me more of your likeness. Enlarge my soul to contain fullness of holiness. Engage me to live more for you. Help me to be less pleased with my spiritual experiences. And when I feel at ease after sweet communings, teach me it is far too little I know and do. Blessed Lord, let me climb up near to you and love and long and plead and wrestle with you and pant for deliverance from the body of sin. For my heart is wandering and lifeless. My soul mourns to think it should ever lose sight of its beloved. Wrap my life in divine love. Keep me ever desiring you, always humble and resigned to your will, more fixed on you that I may be more fitted for doing and for suffering. Amen. Well, let's sing together. He became sin. Who knew no sin that we might become. 
What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to this What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus you brought heaven down My sin was great Your love was greater What could separate us now What a wonderful name it is What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Christ wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again you have no rival you have no equal now and forever God you reign yours is the King Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. Of Jesus, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus.
You have been so, so good to me. I felt no worth. You paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind. self away oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God yeah yeah shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down lie you won't tear down coming after me there's no shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. All the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love. self away Oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God spun creations his pride and adoration treasures woven by his love his careful hands they hold us safe within his promise of calling and of destiny creations his pride and adoration treasures woven by his love his careful hands they hold us safe within his promise of calling and of destiny and I will sing of all you've done and I'll remember how far you've carried me from beginning until the end. You are faithful, faithful to the end. A father's heart that's for me, a never-ending story of love that's always chasing me. Overwhelming, a hope. For 
for me unending He's never given up on me And I will sing of all you've done And I'll remember how far you've carried me From beginning until the end You are faithful And a day I let you run by my side There was a day that you let me fall And all of my life You've always been true With all of my life I worship you There wasn't a day that you run by my side and a day that you let me fall With all of my life Your love has been true With all of my life I will worship you And I will sing of all you've done and I'll remember how far you've carried me From beginning until the end You are faithful, faithful to the end First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. Paul writes, If I could speak all the languages of earth, you imagine, all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just irritating religious noise. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans, and possessed all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Nothing. The word is udes. It literally means not a thing. Doesn't mean half of a thing or a percentage of a thing. Not a thing. No thing. In other words, I could I could speak in tongues. I could speak all the languages of earth. I could know I could know everything about eschatology six ways from Sunday. But unless it's motivated by love, producing love, and being done for the purpose of furthering love, it's not a thing. It's not a kingdom thing. It's no thing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, every penny, and even sacrifice my body, if I martyr myself, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Again, udes, not a thing, not a kingdom thing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Love is patient. We've been camped on that phrase uh, for a little while now, and uh, today will be kind of the final um, lesson where we continue to press in to this patient quality of agape. Uh, next week, we'll move on to the next characteristic of love, which is kindness. And so uh, for today, I'm hoping that, you know, we're beginning to grab onto what it is that Paul is communicating to us about the patient quality of agape, that love is patient. It's macro thumeo. It is a long, long, long way away from anger. Anger is the emotion of judgment, and both judgment and anger are the exclusive domain of God. And so when Paul says love is patient, what I want us to kind of pay attention to today is the fact that patience is not primarily about external behavior. 
Patience is not primarily about external behavior. What God is not looking for is for you and for me to somehow um, know how to uh, appear or behave patiently on the outside while at the same time having anger on the inside. Anger is not primarily about external behavior. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at Ephesians 4, 26. That's that verse where Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Well, how do you have anger and not sin? Well, you get rid of the anger as quickly as possible. You don't embrace it. You don't hold on to it. You don't let the sun go down on it. Because if you do, you're giving Satan a foothold. You're giving him an opportunity to influence you. So the way that 26th verse uh, goes is like this. In your anger, orge, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your par orge. Paul switches up the words there a little bit. That prefix par means alongside. And Paul's point is this. If you don't get rid of anger right away, if you do let the sun go down on it, well, it becomes par orge. It's now alongside. It's now uh, with you kind of wherever you go. It's a little bit like an American Express card. You don't leave home without it because you've internalized it. It's in your gut. It's souring. It's putrefying, and it will come out. It might not come out for a month, and when it does come out, it may come out as thumos, which is the Greek word for rage, for when you snap, when you lose it. It's used in Revelation 12, 12 to describe the emotion of Satan, which isn't surprising because if you give Satan a foothold by not getting rid of anger, uh, you give him an opportunity to influence, it's not a surprise that that anger will come out in a way that is kind of consistent with the emotions of Satan. And that anger might not come out, as I said, for a month, and it might come out as, as rage. You snap, you lose it, and it can come out in a context that is completely unrelated to the original context that caused that anger in the first place. And when it comes out as, as thumos, there's, um, there's like a debris field. There's collateral damage. It hurts people. Anger hurts uh, couples. It hurts children. It hurts families. It hurts churches. And so what God is um, calling us toward here is not simply to be people who know how to behave patiently as an outward behavior. He's not looking us for, for us to know how to behave patiently while at the same time we harbor anger on the inside. No, it's not about an external behavior. It would be completely um, stupid of me and even irresponsible to sit here this morning and to say to you, hey, Sobel Online, be patient. You know, this week, try really hard to be patient. Try really hard to exhibit some, some really good patient behaviors. Or, you know, with, with the next characteristic in line, it would be um, really irresponsible of me to say, hey, you know, get out there and, and really give it the old college try and try and be kind and exhibit some really kind behaviors. We really need to guard against seeing these characteristics of love described in 1 Corinthians 13 as behaviors. We need to guard against that. We need to guard against looking at them as behavioral hoops through which we jump. Because if we do that, all we end up doing is training people how to act. We just train people uh, how to behave, how to fake it, how to fake it until you make it. We simply end up training people how to crank out certain behaviors. And churches are notorious for this. Preachers are notorious for this. Youth pastors are notorious for this. Simply training people how to act. Here's the thing. You can act patient and not be patient. You can act kind and not be kind. And so what Paul is getting at in 1 Corinthians 13 is that unless everything you do and everything you say, all of your actions, unless it's motivated by love and producing love and being done for the purpose of furthering love, it's udes. It's nothing. It's not a thing. It's not a kingdom thing. And not only is it not a thing, but it's potentially damaging. It's potentially harmful. God wants us to be people of love, people who grow in love, live in love, walk in love, and when we walk in love, there will be patience. 
But learning how to act patient is not what gives you love. And, as I said, it can be uh, potentially very damaging. What God is calling us to is to be a certain kind of people, to be literally agape people, people who genuinely, literally are slow to become angry. He's calling us to be people who see the world the way he sees it, to see people the way he sees them, as, as of unsurpassable worth, created in the image and likeness of God and worth Jesus dying for. An agape person will be a patient person. And so walk in love, live in love, as long as you live love. Every day we just agree with the Spirit about the unsurpassable worth of all people. We just commit at the core of our being to be an agape person. We just commit every day that our words and our actions will ascribe to others the worth that we see in them, and then we will be patient. To, um, to kind of press into this a little bit more deeply, I want you to think of a time when you were impatient with somebody. Think of that, it, it may have been recently, it may have been quite some time ago, but think of, a, of an occasion in your life where you were impatient with somebody. Think about that situation, think about that person, see them clearly in your mind. Try and recall what was going on in your mind at the time. Here's probably what was not going on in your mind. God, these people are of unsurpassable worth. They're created in your image and likeness. Jesus, they're worth you giving your life for. They're so precious, Jesus. I just see them the way that you see them, Jesus. They're just incredibly uh, precious. That probably was not going on in your mind during that occasion of impatience. Probably what was going on in your mind is something like this. This person... Uh, is not fitting into my agenda. This person is not fitting into my plans. One of the things my dad taught me was to be on time. Learn to be on time. Um, he taught me that when you're late, it's rude, it's disruptive, it's disrespectful, so learn to be on time. In fact, learn to be early, he taught me. Learn to have margin, it's way less stressful. And uh, there was a time a couple of years ago where I was working at the uh, office of Blue Water Church, our daughter church in Kincardine, and I had to go to a meeting out of town, but I was trying to get some things done in the office before heading out. And in all honesty, I was trying to get too many little things done before leaving, and I left it kind of a little bit late. Not too late that I couldn't get in the car and still be on time, but I had no margin at this point. And so uh, I got in my car, got out on the road, and at one point in the trip, I got behind a Toyota Corolla. And the person driving this Toyota was substantially older than me. And it wasn't like she was driving slowly. She was driving both slow and fast. Um, like in those, in those areas where I could pass her, uh, like nice clear stretch of road, no oncoming traffic, she would drive fast. She'd drive like 100. And I'd be like, okay, 100's great. I can, I can live with that. That's, that's fine. And like, I don't want to pass you while you're doing 100 because then I'd have to go like too fast. I don't want to get a ticket because that would really slow me down. Then I'd be late for sure. But then in those areas where I couldn't pass her, like going up a hill or with oncoming traffic, she'd slow down to like 70. And this happened uh, two or three times. In fact, it happened, I almost thought she was doing it on purpose. It was like, am I being punked? Is there a camera here? Uh, am I on TV? And I got, I got frustrated. And I got angry. And it was like, come on. Like, does your Toyota Corolla not have cruise control? Do you not know how to use it? Like, come on, not everybody's retired. Uh, some of us still have to work, and we've got places to go, and we've got uh, things to do. Anyway, I finally got around her. It seemed like it took forever, but it probably wasn't that long. But when I passed her, you know, here's what I did. I pull out to pass her, and when I got alongside of her, I gave her one of these, to which she was completely oblivious, but... You know, the old stink eye, right? And then when I passed her and I pulled back in, I didn't signal to pull back in. It was like, you don't deserve me uh, using my blinker. 
Uh, you don't deserve the courtesy of me uh, doing that. A little bit later in that same trip, I came to a stop sign and uh, it was uh, like a T kind of intersection. So there's a road uh, going this way, uh, a two lane road and I had to stop. I needed to go left. And so as I hit that stop sign, I need to go left. There's a pickup truck coming uh, this way and coming kind of slowly, and I can see that it's a man, uh, that he too is substantially older than me. He looks like the, the stereotypical retired farmer, kind of going slow, sort of looking at the fields like that. He was going slow enough that I thought he's probably going to turn right in front of me, in which case I can actually go ahead and go left, but he didn't have a signal on, so I thought, uh, I don't want to pull out just in case he's going to carry right straight down the road and uh, we'd have uh, a, a problem. And so I had to wait for him. And indeed, he did turn right, right in front of me. He did put his blinker on, but at the last second, like it blinked once. And I'm like, you, what, what was the day? Dave, Dave uh, last week in the online sermon, I think he used the word moron. You moron. Like, you're supposed to put your blinker on well in advance. If I knew you were turning, I could have pulled out. So by the time I had to wait for him, now there's traffic coming from the other direction. See, the window of opportunity had closed. I'm like frustrated and angry. At other um, places in that trip, I would get behind people. And it's not that they'd be going slow. They'd be going the speed limit. But like, who does that? Who drives the speed limit? You're not supposed to drive the speed limit. Even the cops give you like this buffer zone. You're supposed to drive faster than that, right? You see, I had an agenda. I had somewhere to be. I had things to do. And this lady and this guy, they should have understood that. They should have just understood that I've got an agenda. I've got places to go. And so you're supposed to drive a normal speed. You're supposed to put your blinker on. You're supposed to turn like a normal person, you're supposed to drive a consistent speed, you're supposed to drive faster than 80 kilometers an hour, you're supposed to go faster when you see a yellow light, not slow down, and certainly don't slow down while it's green, thinking that it might go yellow, right? That is impatience. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, back to the fall. It's the fall all over again, really. Because what we do is we put ourselves at the center, and everything revolves around us, and it's about our agenda. And we want other people, and we want circumstances to fit into our agenda. And when it doesn't, we get frustrated. We get angry. And that frustration and that anger is called impatience. And we impose our supposed tos on other people. You're supposed to drive faster. You're supposed to uh, signal properly. You're supposed to go at consistent speed, etc. And it, it even goes beyond the driving thing, right? Hey, hey, four-year-old kid who's heading off to JK, you're supposed to know how to tie your shoes by now. Hey, eight-year-old kid, you're supposed to know how to read better uh, at this point than you do. Hey, uh, Christian, you've been a Christian now for three years. You're supposed to be more mature uh, than you are. Like, what's wrong with you? It's been three years. You're supposed to do this, and you're supposed to do that. And when people don't measure up to our supposed tos, we get frustrated. And that frustration is called impatience. It's like, come on, do it my way. Do it, do it at my speed. Do it how I want it done. Do it when I want it done. We impose our standard. And the standard that we impose on others, the, the, the supposed tos that we suppose on others, whenever we put ourselves in the center and it's about our agenda, our supposed tos are always skewed in our favor. They're always bent in our favor. They're always self-serving. Because, like, let's face it, we never have trouble being patient with the person who fits into our agenda. We never have trouble being patient with the person who doesn't delay us. But we do have trouble being patient with the person who does not fit into our agenda and does slow us down. My uh, eldest son, whom I love like crazy, um, inherited kind of a bad thing from me. He inherited my gene for losing things. Uh, keys, wallet, 
checks, uh, that kind of thing. He has since learned uh, over the years that um, the only way to not lose your keys is actually to never take them out of the ignition. And the only way to never lock yourself out of your house is to literally, like, never lock the door. Uh, My wife, Jean, never loses stuff. Uh, She always knows where everything is. She's incredibly organized, and she can't understand, like, what is so hard about putting things back where they go? Everything has a place. Put it back in its place. If you put things back in your place, uh, you'll never lose anything. And uh, so she has asked me some some form of that question many times uh, during our married lives together. Why can't you just put things back where they go? then you'll never lose them. Now, my wife would tend to be more impatient toward my eldest son and his proclivity to lose things. But I, on the other hand, uh, I, I, I have more compassion for him because I understand. I understand that keys will just disappear. You can put a set of keys on a table, turn your, turn your head, five minutes later you look, those keys are gone. They just disappear. I lose checks. Thankfully, we're living in a day and age where checks are becoming less and less of a thing, but every once in a while, there will still be a check. It's got my name on it, and I've got to put it in the bank, and Gene very reluctantly will hand me this check and say, make sure you put this in the bank today. And I'll get home at the end of the day, and and, uh, she'll ask me the question, did you put the check in the bank today? And I will say, oops, I forgot. And she'll say, where is the check? And I'll say, I think it's in my computer bag. Either that, or it's in my car. And if it's not in my car, then it's probably on my desk. It's likely in one of those three places. See, I I tend to be very patient with people who struggle in the same areas that I do. But if I'm good at something, well then I struggle to be patient with people who aren't. Like I think a, a good example of this is Um, shopping. For instance, so I have a particular philosophy of shopping, and Jean has a very different philosophy of shopping. I'm not saying that hers is right and mine is wrong, or mine is right and hers is wrong. They're just different, very different. My philosophy of shopping is um, you get in, you get what you want, you get out. Like, shopping to me should take like 12 minutes. You park your car, start the timer. You get out of your car, you go into the store, you find the thing you want, you pick it up, you take it to the counter, you pay for it, you get out. By the time you're back in your car, yeah, 12 minutes. That's about right. Now, Jean approaches shopping very differently. For her, it is far more of a process. It's, it's, it's more of an art form uh, for her. She uh, likes to shop and she likes to compare things. And, um, you know, COVID has been really difficult for her Shopping-wise, because when she shops, like for clothing, for instance, she likes to touch things. She likes to, to, to feel things, to touch. Um, if she's shopping for something other than clothes, she likes to, to, to feel the weight of things and the heft of things. And so online shopping is just uh, not helpful for that kind of shopping experience. And so she'll, you know, I'll go shopping with her like back in the old days uh, before COVID. We'd go shopping together and maybe she's looking for some clothes. Well, she likes to try things on and then she likes to, uh, to get my opinion. And of course, that is just fraught with uh, all kinds of peril, right? So she'll try something on and she'll say, how does this look on me? Does this make my butt look big? Uh, Sometimes the questions are even trickier than that. Like, for instance, if she says, she'll try something on and she'll she'll come out, she'll model it, and then ask the question, or she'll say, you know, I don't know, what do you think? And like, it's danger, danger, right? And trying to, trying to read her mind and what is it that she, what is the right answer in this situation? And, you know, by this point in the shopping process, I'm getting kind of tired of it. I'm starting to feel a little bit impatient. So I know I can probably give an answer that's going to make this shopping process um, go faster. But there's also an answer that I can give that's going to prolong things a little bit. And, um, 
I don't know about you. Maybe this is a guy thing. But whenever I, I, I shop with it, say we're going clothes shopping, maybe we're in a mall kind of going store to store. I just get really tired. Does that happen to, to any of you guys? It's like you start shopping and you start that slow trudging pace through store after store and all the stores kind of look the same, right? There's just this wave of fatigue uh, that comes over me and so tired. It's like legs heavy, must sit, can't go on. It's easy for us to be patient in the areas uh, where we ourselves need patience. But if there's something that seems to be impeding our agenda, that seems to be taking our time, well, then it's really easy to have those impatient buttons uh, pushed uh, in our lives. This is why, for instance, this this is kind of a church secret that we probably don't talk, but let's just put it on the table. This is why Christians tend not to judge the sins of other Christians when those sins are the same sins with which they themselves struggle. No, it's in the areas that we've conquered where we've experienced some victory that we tend to to judge other people. And it's like, hey, come on, I got over that. What's the matter with you? I dealt with that in like two days. You're still dealing with it six months later. I quit smoking cold turkey. You're still chewing Nicorette like six months down the road. What's what's wrong with you? Um, We always tend to judge out of our success. We always tend to judge out of our supposed to's, out of our success. And when we do that, it's not loving. It's not loving. We're not ascribing to people unsurpassable worth. In fact, we're detracting worth from people. When you're impatient, it's, it's always harmful. It's always harming uh, the other person. Um, detracting worth, like what's wrong with you? Can't you see? Can't you read? Are you blind? Do you not get it? Are you out of it? You're not fast enough. You're not trying hard enough. What's wrong with you? What's your deal? When you impose supposed to's on others, it's damaging. We need, we need to keep in mind the simple fact that people are profoundly different from one another. We are. We're, we struggle in different areas. We're good at different things. We learn differently. We learn at different paces from other people. Patience is giving other people the space and the grace to be unlike you. Patience is giving other people the space and the grace to be unlike you. Patience is affirming the unsurpassable worth of someone who is very different from you. But when we're in the center, when it's about me, when it's about my agenda, well, then I'm imposing my supposed to's on other people, and that is the recipe for impatience. All right, so what we want to do here um, is begin to wrap up. I'm not wrapping up, but let's begin to wrap up. I've got two questions that I want to ask, and then one uh, very small exercise that we'll close with, all right? So question number one, and and these questions sound, I don't want them to sound confrontational, but they are a little bit pointed because I want us to really think about this. Question number one, who made you the judge of supposed tos? Who made you the judge of supposed tos? When we are imposing our supposed tos on other people, it's Genesis 3 all over again. It's the fall all over again. Um, I'm in the center. I'm in the center of the garden. I'm the tree of good and evil. I'm the one who's imposing supposed tos. I'm deciding what's good and what's evil. I'm, d- I'm imposing that on you. It's back to Genesis 3, and we're playing God, and we're putting our supposed tos on other people. The, the fact of the matter is, your job and my job as followers of Jesus is to, um, to replicate the love of God and to extend that love to all others at all times, in all circumstances and situations, no ifs, ands, or buts, even to our enemies. That's our job, to receive the love of God, to replicate that love and extend it to all others. We're to be like God in his love, but to be not like God in his judgment. God has not called us to be the judge of supposed tos and then to impose those supposed tos on other people. 
Let me qualify that just a little bit because I think there are a couple of exceptions that are worth noting. One of the exceptions is simply a, a, a workplace exception. Uh, maybe you're a boss, a supervisor, a manager, a foreman, um, and it's your job to impose supposed tos. You've got people who are accountable to you. You yourself are accountable to somebody else. So you're the one who, who imposes the supposed tos. And then you're the one who monitors and assesses how those people are, um, are measuring up to those supposed tos. And that's a different thing. That's a workplace thing. That's, a, that's, a, that's an employment situation. So that's one exception. And then there's another exception that is probably... I don't know, maybe less common. And it's, it's a situation where, um, where we really need the wisdom of God to know when patience ends and where enabling begins. Because patience is loving. Enabling is not. And there are times where love needs to confront and where love needs to draw a line in the sand. There are cases where it is not in the best interest of a person to simply allow them to carry on um, and to keep cutting them slack in areas that are perhaps dangerous. Maybe they're a thumasaholic, a rageaholic. Maybe they're abusive. Maybe they're an alcoholic. And to just keep giving them um, slack um, is not giving space and grace. It's actually giving rope for them to get themselves all tangled up. And so there are times where we need to distinguish the difference between um, patience and enabling. And sometimes knowing where one ends and where the other begins is really difficult, and so we need uh, God's wisdom in that. But it's not loving to a person. It's not loving to a family. It's not loving to yourself uh, to simply... Uh, just continually give people more and more rope. Um, there are times that love needs to rise up and confront. There are times when love needs to take reality and hold it in the face of somebody because they're not living in reality. There are times where love really must draw a line and say, you know, if this doesn't stop, you know, here's the consequences. Um, sometimes love does that. That is not inconsistent with love. Patience is loving, enabling is not. And sometimes that confrontation is really in their best interest. It is ascribing worth. It is, it is acknowledging and affirming their unsurpassable worth to do that. But most of the time when we're impatient, it's not an employment thing. It's not a, it's not a is this enabling, is this patience? It's not that. Most of the time when we're impatient, we're not even thinking of other people. Most of the time when we're impatient, we're really thinking of ourselves. It's about me. It's about my agenda. It's about my preferences. It's about my wants. And it's wanting everybody uh, around me to fit into my agenda. It's about me and my agenda. And when people don't measure up to my supposed to's, I, I become impatient. So there are those exceptions. I think they are worth noting. So question one, who made you the judge of supposed to's? And question two is this, can you see how God has been infinitely patient with you. We actually asked this question a couple of weeks ago in our communion service. Can you see how God has been infinitely patient with you? You know, God is the one who, who can impose the supposed tos. And he could have. You know, the first time that you sinned, he could have imposed supposed tos on you. But he has been and is infinitely patient with you. Even after you and I came to Jesus as Savior, God has been patient with us because we don't get it right all the time. We don't perform perfectly all of the time. God continues to be patient with us. Every day that you're on planet Earth is an exercise of patience on God's part. And I know that there are areas in your life right now where God is exercising patience. I know that about you because I know that about me. And God is patient with you about that. And God continues to work um, in you and in me to transform us into the image and likeness of Jesus in increasing measure. And even in that, he does that patiently. 
And so as we've said, the, the, the main job of our lives is to take what we have received from God and replicate that and extend it to all others. And so we've received lavishly the love of God. So we replicate that love and we extend it to all others at all times, in all circumstances, no ifs, ands, or buts, even to our enemies. And we've received the infinite patience of God. And so we extend to others the patient quality of agape. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 and 4. Verse 1, he says, You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad, and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, in other words, when you judge them and you impose your supposed to's on them, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. And then verse 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient, macrothumeo, God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? When we don't extend to others what God has given to us, we're really despising what it is that God has given to us. And Paul helps us to see that the kindness of God, the patience of God, is, is meant to uh, lead us to repentance, to turn from our sin. And so God is patient with you for the purpose of turning you. You don't turn in order to get God's patience. No, God's patience is there, and it's his patience that causes you to turn. And so it is. God has been infinitely patient with us. And so we extend to others that same patience. We extend to others the patient quality of agape. We don't impose our supposed to's on them, trying to get them to conform to our agenda. No, it's our patience, the patient quality of our love that causes them to turn. And to exhibit this patient quality of love in order to do that, we completely have to jettison from our life this false notion that we are somehow at the center, that it's about me, it's about my agenda. We have to jettison that completely. As long as we live with ourselves at the center and it's about me and my agenda, we will be impatient. You can uh, count on that. Unless we can reckon God at the center and recognize that he's at the center and that our job is to replicate his love and his patience and that we see the world the way he sees it and that we see other people the way he sees them as of unsurpassable worth, unless we reckon God at the center, we'll be impatient. But with God at the center, we can live in love and we can display macro thumeo in our lives. And so daily, uh, every day, we need to acknowledge that we're not at the center. And we need to live with God at the center. God doesn't orbit us. We orbit God. And it is that orientation and understanding that orientation every day that leads to the behavior. So the behavior of patience follows the orientation. So every day we acknowledge that God is at the center. Every day we acknowledge our job as, as that of replicating his love and his patience. Being a agape person, seeing the worth of all others at all times in all situations. And when we do that, the behavior of patience will follow. We don't pursue the behavior, we pursue love. If your life is not manifesting patience. Don't pursue patience. Don't pursue the behavior. Pursue love because love is patient. If your life is not manifesting kindness, don't pursue the behavior of kindness. Pursue love because love is kindness. We need to understand that orientation. Okay, very quick exercise here and then we'll wrap up. I want you to think right now, who are the people in your life right now in this season with whom you're having difficulty being patient? Who are the people you are prone to be impatient with right now? Think of, think of one person. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's one of your kids. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's a sibling. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's somebody in church. 
uh, who are you having trouble being patient with? See that person. See them clearly. And ask God for his wisdom. Say, God, is there something I need to confront? Has this gone beyond patience to enabling? And if so, God, I need your wisdom to know that and to know how to confront. If it's not that, maybe you've got an agenda for them. Maybe you're imposing your agenda on them, and maybe your agenda is something that you need to let go. To let go of an agenda that you have to try and get people, uh, you're trying to get people to conform to your agenda. Would you ask the Lord to reveal that to you? Say, Lord, show me where, where I'm imposing my supposed tos on other people, trying to uh, impose my agenda on them. Because when you do that, you will be impatient. Are you willing to release that agenda to God and to let him be the center and not you? Let's pray. Our Father, as we close this uh, online service today, I pray that you would be revealing to us those areas in our lives where self is still at the center and where we're imposing our supposed tos on other people. God, would you free us from that? Would you free us to be outrageously loving like Jesus? Jesus, would you live through us? Help us to let go of our agendas for other people. Help us to give people the space and the grace to be different from us. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you next time. Well, we are honored that you were here with us today. And we'd love to hear from you. Whether you're tuning in for the first time, or maybe you've been here for a while and haven't yet said hi, or you're a regular and there's a way that we can help, simply go to hello.sobblechurch.ca and drop us a note. If you have a prayer need you'd like to share, we would love to pray with you or for you. Simply call the church office for prayer or head over to prayer.sobblechurch.ca and let us know what it is. We can keep it confidential or we can share it with any of our active prayer groups that meet throughout the week. When we started our time together today, I asked you a question. Do you long for God? When we focus on God, everything else begins to correct itself as he does the work within us. If you find yourself being unkind, don't try to change and be more kind. Focus on God. God is love and love is kind. If you find yourself struggling with pride, don't try to be less proud. Focus on God. God is love and love is not boastful or proud. If you find yourself short on patience, don't try to be more patient. Focus on God because God is love and love is patient. Focus on God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. We love you. We wish God's best for you and your family, and we hope to see you back with us again next week.